and share screen. All right, so, so this kind of went over some of the stuff from the respiratory system last class that so says at sea level, the partial pressure of oxygen of the gas in the alveoli after inhalation is about what? Um, so this was, this is important to, you know, this is what's driving the movement of oxygen from the alveoli into the blood. And again, 75% of the people got it, 100. We talked about, um, you know, the pressure of just the air is about 760 millimeters of mercury. Um, the partial pressure of oxygen is going to be 21% of that, which is more like around 160 millimeters of mercury. And then by the time you get down into the alveoli and mixing the fresh with the stale air, you're down to about 100 millimeters of mercury. Um, the blood returning from the tissues is down at around 40 millimeters of mercury, and that's what drives the movement of oxygen from the alveoli into the blood. Because the alveoli air is 100, and the blood is 40, and so the oxygen moves along its pressure gradient. Um, this one, this is going to be important if you got this wrong to kind of keep the order of things correct. It says, which best describes inspiration during pulmonary ventilation? And like I mentioned, it's, it can be a little non-intuitive. Like the first thing that happens is, you know, well, there's the chest volume increases because of the muscles, the diaphragm particularly because of that suction between the pleura, that increases the volume of the lungs. And so that's the first thing. And when we're thinking about the lungs, the volume increases. That increased volume due to Boyle's law creates a low pressure. And then that low pressure compared to outside is going to cause air to flow in. So again, first the lung volume increases then that is going to cause the pressure to go down due to Boyle's law. And then that pressure gradient is going to cause air to flow into the lungs. So make sure that that makes sense. Um, and then breathing out the exhalation, expiration is going to be the same basic idea in reverse. You know, the muscles relax, the volume gets smaller. As the volume gets smaller, the pressure goes up. When the pressure is higher inside your lungs compared to the outside, now the pressure gradient is going to cause the air to flow out of you. So, so again, make sure that that kind of causality makes sense. What causes what? Volume changes, drive pressure differences, drive the movement of the air. Which is again different than blowing up a balloon. Blowing up a balloon, the air going into the balloon increases the pressure, which then increases the size. So that's, that's a very different, that's like this positive pressure as opposed to what's going on with your pulmonary ventilation. Oh, which muscle, yeah, everybody got this. I just, yeah, this is all the same answer. Um, I just knew that some people would write diaphragm, some would write di diaphragm, some people would misspell diaphragm, but this was good. Again, other muscles do help, um, particularly when you're doing like your forced breathing, like, you know, then there's other muscles that are more, but in general, you know, the majority of your ventilation is driven by the diaphragm. Um, what nerve innervates the diaphragm? Phrenic. Phrenic. Phrenic nerve, right? So that's that's like the only of the major nerves we actually looked at in this class. You know, in anatomy, we go through a lot of classes, but in this class, I want to kind of re-emphasize phrenic nerve. It's critical to keep breathing, right? Your heart, your heart has its own intrinsic conduction system inside, right? If, again, I talked about like the zombie apocalypse, you pull the heart out of somebody's chest, the heart's going to just keep beating in your hand. But the lungs don't work like that. The lungs, the 
uh, main control, neural control is up in the pons and the medulla. And then that has to constantly send messages down the phrenic nerve, down to the diaphragm. And that constant innervation of the diaphragm keeps you breathing. If so if something damages that, like for instance, if you have a spinal cord injury above um, C3, you know, and you're not gonna get messages down the phrenic nerve, you're gonna stop breathing and you're gonna die. So it's important to and I remember diaphragm is the main thing driving breathing. Diaphragm is run by phrenic nerve coming out of, we talked about cervical nerves three through five. Um, that's why, that's why, you know, they say C3 through five keep you alive, right? If you get a spinal cord injury above there, you're no longer operating the diaphragm and you're no longer ventilating the lungs. Continuing. Large air passages such as the trachea, bronchi held patent or open by cartilage. Okay, everybody got that? Like I mentioned, when you get down into the really small little passages, the little bronchioles, then there's no more cartilage. Then it's just smooth muscle is enough. And then that smooth muscle is controlled by the autonomic nervous system, can you know, increase or decrease the diameter. Um, Name at least three different ways your respiratory system handles the dust you breathe in. Um, so for this one, um, there's lots of different ways. When I was grading this, you know, if somebody gave me, you know, cilia and mucus as two different things, I didn't really count those as two different things because those are two different aspects of the same mechanism, right? The mucus kind of catches the dust and the cilia sweep it to the back of the throat. Um, you know, I wanted things that were different. You know, there's like the nose hairs, the vibrissae, which is one thing, or the mucus and the cilia working together. Um, I did, for this case, I gave people credit if they did coughing versus sneezing, even though I consider those kind of two aspects of the same thing, because they're both explosive air movements. One's going through the upper respiratory, one's going through the lower respiratory. Um, you know, there's also the alveolar macrophages, the dust cells um, moving around. Um, so, yeah, lots of different ways that your, your um, respiratory system tries to keep itself free of dust and all that. Um, so let's stop sharing that. Um, all right, so today we are doing the, the urinary system. Um, One quick question before we begin. This is all not going to be on the test. This is new stuff. Um, correct. So the test will go up through everything from yesterday, Tuesday, respiratory system. Um, Everything we're going to do today is going to be on exam four, which isn't going to come until actually the after the last day of class. It's the exam we have during finals week. Um, kind of reiterate, um, exam four, even though it's during finals week, is basically another unit exam. It's covering material from urinary system through the reproductive system, through the end of the, the um, our, our class. Um, in addition, during the finals week, there will be an optional comprehensive exam, which people can take if they want, that can replace a low score. Um, it won't replace exam four, but it will replace um, the score on exam one, two, or three, um, if that ended up being particularly low. Um, Again, the thinking that if you if you actually know the material by the end of the semester, that's what's really important. Um, you know, if you've done well on exams one through three, then there's no reason to take it. It's just kind of a waste of your time. You should go just enjoy yourself. Um, so. Yeah, I always feel 
it's important to use like the yellow for the urinary system. Um, so as we start this one, we should talk about all of the functions that it does. Um, and it's doing a lot of important things. What is the role of the urinary system in human physiology? Filters the blood. So filters, you know, fil filtration is part, I would say, um, I want something a little more specific. Um, remove uh, toxins or materials that we don't need. Yeah, so one is, can it, yeah, so let's say it removes wastes. So, but in, when we say excrete, we mean actually leaves the body. So like, you know, through peeing. You know, you know, so there's like nitrogenous waste, like urea and creatinine, um, met metabolic um, wastes, you know, et cetera. There's all sorts of stuff that your body has to get rid of. And the urinary system is a way to actually get something out of your body that you don't want. Um, what other things does the urinary system do? Fluid balance. That's a huge one. So water balance. You know, by either keeping the water in your body or peeing it out, that's how you maintain your water balance, your osmolarity. And what is this also critical part of? We talked about blood pressure. Uh huh. All right, so that water balance is a critical part of just maintaining the osmolarity of your body. It's critical for maintaining your resting blood pressure. So water balance. What other things does the urinary system do? pH balance. It's going to be critical for pH balance. Um, we're going to talk kind of at the end of today about kind of the big picture of pH balance. Um, the urinary system is the main kind of long-term control of pH balance. You know, we've seen buffer systems that can react instantly. Um, we, I talked about the respiratory system changing pH by having more or less CO2 in your body. Um, urinary system can literally pee out hydrogens or bicarbonates to um, do the main long-term control of your pH. So we're gonna, when we look at pH balance um, kind, of as a, kind of as a whole um, in a little bit, we'll see the urinary system is a critical part of that. Um, what other things does it do? Electrolyte balance. You know, this is, you know, sodium, potassium, etc. Right, we know that the amount of these electrolytes, these ions is critical to this functioning, all the signaling in our body and all that. Um, the urinary system are gonna be the ones that are making sure that we have the right amount, maintaining the homeostasis of electrolytes. Um, and actually when I talk, talking about you know both of these, these are gonna come up in our lab next week. Um, I'm going to talk about kind of coming up with hypotheses for the next week's lab um, a little later, but just kind of a little spoiler alert. 
as part of your pH balance and electrolyte balance, you know, your kidneys, your urinary system are going to have to decide what to keep in your body and what to let go of, right? So, you know, the pH, is your urine acidic or basic? It really depends on what you've been eating and everything. And what does your kidney have to do in order to maintain pH balance? If, if you're a little too acidic, you might have to pee out more hydrogens, in which case you're urine is going to be more acidic. A different kind of diet means you might actually be peeing out bicarbonates, in which case your urine might be alkaline. <coughs> Same thing with electrolyte balance. You've just been gobbling salty pretzels. You might have really salty urine. Or maybe all you've been eating is carrot sticks and drinking tons of water. You might have you know, really, really dilute urine that's pretty much just like water. Right, so your urinary system is going to either hold on to things or remove things from your body as appropriate to maintain pH balance, maintain electrolyte balance. Um, what else do I want to say here? Um, so there's a couple of other like kind of things on the side. Uh, uh, would it be, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, would it be okay to say uh, it controls autonomic controls uh, nervous system by releasing uh, epinephrine uh, via the adrenal gland? It doesn't do that. Yeah, that, so that would not be right. So what it does do though is um, help control blood pressure through the renin angiotensin mechanism. So it releases renin. Which we talked about starting that whole renin angiotensin mechanism. Um, and we'll talk about more in detail what part of the kidney is doing that and under what conditions that makes sense. Um, this can be activated by the sympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system can tweak this to cause the renin release, but it can also happen just due to the kidneys noticing blood pressure dropping. Um, it releases erythropoietin. This is, I've mentioned, this is what um, increases red blood cell production. Again, sometimes people call it EPO, particularly if you're talking about it as a performance enhancing thing. Um, this doesn't make, I'm not quite sure why the kidneys are in charge of this, but they are. So if, um, if your body needs to increase its ability to transport oxygen, the kidneys will release erythropoietin, which will tell the um, hematopoietic tissues to increase um, blood, red blood cell production. Um, another thing the kidneys do um, activates vitamin D. Um, vitamin D, you know, it gets its name from dermis of your skin. This is the one that gets created um, in, you need ultraviolet light. This is why you need to be out in the sun. If you don't have enough sun, you usually don't make enough vitamin D, but it's actually the kidneys are necessary for activating this. And vitamin D is necessary to absorb calcium. Right, that's, you know, kids, you know, right now, if you buy milk, it's always fortified with vitamins A and D. Um, so it's not, as, it's not as common, like it used to be like kids who weren't getting enough sunlight and therefore not making enough vitamin D, were not absorbing enough calcium, their bones got soft and they get rickets where their legs would bend under their own weight. You know, they'd be bow-legged. 
right? I mean, that's that's one of those trippy things. Like you always think about orthopedics, right? What does an orthopedic surgeon do? Uh, put bones into position. Yeah, exactly. Those are these are the kind of the surgeons that are more like carpenters, like sawing and hammering and things. But ortho means straight. Ped, pediatrics. This is kids, children. So this was like little kids who had rickets and their legs were bow legged, and they'd have to like break them and reset them and straighten them. So that's kind of, if you ever wonder like why are orthopedic surgeons named after, you know, straightening kids? It's because of, you know, kids who didn't have enough vitamin D and the calcium wasn't absorbed and their legs were soft, leg bones got soft and bowed out. Um, but back to the urinary system. Um, Again, removing waste is just one little, it's not one little, but just one part. When you think about what the kidneys are doing, they're really important for water balance, pH balance, electrolyte balance. Um, so, and again, our labs are going to kind of focus on that. Um, really kind of hopefully get you thinking about, about that. Um, okay. Let's start with a little bit of just overview of kind of the anatomy of this. So then we can kind of start drilling down and see how, how does your urinary system do all this? You know, so at the core, what are the main organs that are responsible for all of all the things we just talked about? Kidneys. Kidneys. Your kidneys. So these are, you know, they're kind of like in your lower back. I mean, maybe. So lumbar region, they're kind of lower back, um, retroperitoneal, they're, little, they're behind the serous membrane that envelops all your digestive organs. Um, you know, about the size of a bar of soap. Um, shaped like a kidney bean or a kidney pool, kidney shaped pool. Oh, <laughs> I think they get named after the kidneys. Um, it is worth talking about the renal arteries entering in. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers when I was talking about the proportion of blood of your cardiac output that goes to different parts of your body. Does anyone remember how much of your cardiac output goes to your kidneys? Like 25%, 20 to 25. Exactly. So 20 to 25% of cardiac output to the kidneys. So that's huge. So what is a resting cardiac output? Does anybody remember? Five, was it five liters per minute? About five liters per minute. So again, resting cardiac output is about five liters per minute. So that means somewhere between one to one and a quarter liters per minute are heading into your kidneys. Um, this is going to be important. We're going to follow this blood and see what happens to it um, as we get more into detail of the functioning of the kidneys. Um, when we get to when we start talking about filtration and stuff, we're going to so we're going to follow this. So keep this in mind because this we're going to come back to. Um, so the 
there's obviously renal veins draining it, but we'll, you can just assume that the rest of the flow is there. Um, then the stuff that's gonna eventually leave your body, be excreted, whether it is excess water or electrolytes or wastes, they're gonna leave out these things called the ureters. That's too big. Hold on, let me make that a little less dramatic. So the ureters, whatever the kidneys are gonna have to get rid of to do all their balancing act is gonna leave the kidneys via these things called the ureters. Um, obviously it's very convenient to not just dribble out urine constantly as it's being produced. So we have this cool system to store it until we're ready to um, get rid of it. So that's gonna be the urinary bladder. Um, the urinary bladder is got a lot of smooth muscle in. Um, then there is an extra tube. Let's we can make it a little longer here. Whoops. The part that leaves the bladder to the outside world, you know, basically to pee, that is the urethra. So ureters go from the kidneys to the bladder. Urethra goes from the bladder to um, wherever you're peeing. You know, the um, Urethra will, you know, it's, it can be different length. If you are a woman, the urethra is only like an inch and a half. You know, it doesn't have to go very far. The urethral opening is just in the vulva. It's very close. Um, in a guy, the urethra is a lot longer because it has to go down, goes through. When we get to the reproductive system, we'll talk a lot about the different parts of the male urethra, the membranous urethra, prostatic urethra, penile urethra. Um, in general, because the female's urethra is much shorter and also because the female urethra is, um, you know, when the vulva is, um, you know, there's gonna be the urethral opening, the vaginal opening, um, the anus, they're all kind of in the same zone. It's more likely that there's bacteria or something that can make it up to the urethral opening. It's much more common for women to end up with urinary tract infections because this opening is not very, first it's close to where there's bacteria and it's also not a long distance to get up into the urinary tract. Guys, it's much, much less common to have a urinary tract infection because there's a much longer urethra is kind of getting flushed out. Um, so UTIs, um, the urethra has two different sphincters. Um, we'll introduce them now. We'll get back to them as well when we get to the reproductive system. So there's going to be an 
internal sphincter, internal urethral sphincter, which is made out of smooth muscle, and an external which is skeletal muscle. And these are going to be um, operated. Um, one is autonomic. Obviously, the one that smooth muscle is autonomic. This one is part of a reflex that is triggered by stretch receptors in your urinary bladder. Right, the urinary bladder starts filling with urine. It can actually fill up to like a couple of hundred mils without even stretching. But as it keeps filling up, it will start stretching. Those stretch receptors send a message to your spinal cord. This is gonna be a spinal reflex. And that's gonna cause a relaxation of this internal sphincter. And when this internal sphincter relaxes, then you feel this pressure down a little lower and that's like that urge to urinate. It's like, oh, I gotta pee. But luckily you've got the external sphincter, skeletal, voluntary. So you can choose, am I gonna relax this one or not? Is this an appropriate time or place to actually let my flow begin here? Um, if you keep holding it, this kind of, you know, backs off, but then a little later it'll run again and you still get this feeling like, oh yeah, I got to pee. Um, so I think in the, the bladder can hold, I think up to about a liter or so. Um, where, I think I have it here. Yeah, I have here. Yeah, moderate lift. So it, so it can get up to like about a third of a liter without increasing too much pressure. Um, half a liter, you're starting to really feel you got to go. It can fill up to about a liter, I think maximum. Um, and again, when we get to the male reproductive, these two sphincters are going to be important too, because this is the space in between is going to be where all the different parts of the semen are mixing together, the sperm and the seminal fluid and prostatic fluid all kind of mixed together like right before a guy ejaculates. So we'll, this will be a little more, this will be important. For, for a woman, it's just more about control of urination, but in the guy, it's also gonna be important in how the whole kind of ejaculation thing goes on. Um, La, la, la. So we can talk very briefly about kidney stones, renal calculi, right? Calculus is because people used to use like abacuses, the kind of little stones to do math. Renal calculi is also called kidney stones. Again, by definition, um, you know, this happens when things precipitate in the urine. Like if you have very high levels of different minerals or you can have, um, what kind of things can you get? You can get, um, you know, calcium crystals, uh, magnesium crystals, um, uric acid crystals. There's all sorts of different things that can start precipitating. And if that happens, you know, think about if you've got like some kind of a, a super saturated solution of sugar and you start making rock candy in there. It's that same idea. If you've got these crystals starting to precipitate out of the liquid, they can get in here and start blocking the passage of the urine, um, which so this is supposedly insanely painful when you have kidney stones. Um, 
there's like a cool way, like when people do have kidney stones now, rather than cutting somebody open to get them out, there's this thing called um, shockwave lithotripsy. Litho is another thing for stone. Um, like a lithograph is like a big stone that you kind of use different stuff and then put ink on and stuff. Um, shockwave lithotripsy, they actually put you like in this bathtub and they um, focus sound waves that all focus in on the stones, and shatter the stones and then hopefully turn them to sand that then you can pee out. So it's a way of trying to get rid of the kidney stones without actually cutting you open just by using these sound waves. That's why they call it shock wave lithotripsy. Using the sound waves to shatter the stones and making them into small enough things that will pee out that you can pass. Um, so, all right, so I think that's kind of the big picture. What we're gonna do now is, actually a, a few more things we should mention, just, just for completeness here. Um, your kidneys are held in place, again, it's a little more anatomy. They're held in place by a lot of um, fat. There's this what's called the adipose capsule that kind of holds them in place. You know, if you've ever, if you've been in anatomy, when you kind of slice somebody open and you go under the peritoneum and you're looking, where's your kidney? It's like, I don't see it right away. It's like these big fatty pillows and you slice open the little fatty pillow and the, there's the kidney sitting inside. Um, the reason why I am mentioning this is like, this can be another clinical thing that happens is like somebody who is like anorexic, for instance, and losing way too much of their adipose, becoming way too skinny. You can actually have the whole kidney kind of drop. You know, the idea for drooping is, or the word for drooping is ptosis. I mean, you're eyelid can have ptosis if it if something's wrong and it droops weird. But if the whole kidney drops because the um, fat is not adequate, you can kink off the ureter, which can be a problem as well. So that's, that's worth thinking about. Um, other thing, I'll just mention this briefly. Some people just congenitally have instead of two separate kidneys have one, they call it a horseshoe kidney where it never separated into actually two, it just ends up being one big thing, which um, normally you have two kidneys and each kidney alone actually has the capacity to do everything that you need to do to keep all that balance that we've been talking about. So we've been mentioning all of this stuff here Normally, one kidney can do this. You know, I should say one healthy kidney, um, which is why it is possible to donate your kidney to somebody um, because one kidney will still be able to continue doing this stuff. Um, what if both of your kidneys are not working well? What do you need to do? Dialysis. There's dialysis. So I'll talk about that a little later, but you know, dialysis is basically you know, artificial kidney. It's where you actually are taking, you know, taking the blood here, but instead of sending it to the kidneys, you're sending it out to a big machine that is doing those different things we were talking about. Um, or there's also um, um, continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis, which we'll talk about as well, where um, the, um, you don't use a machine, instead you use a dialyzing fluid just in your peritoneum. Um, 
But yeah, if your kidneys are not functioning well, you need something else to um, keep the toxins from building up to maintain your water and electrolyte balance and everything, or else you're not going to live very long. Um, so what we're going to do now is look at the kidneys and figure out what's a going on in the kidneys. Um, so probably makes sense here to look at some pictures from our textbook because it'll give you a good overview. Um, I will upload these onto, um, onto the canvas so you'll have them. All right, so this is just kind of showing what I've been talking about. You've got the kidneys here, there's the bladder, um, sitting here kind of in your abdominal cavity, again, around the lower back. Um, here is a kidney. And a bunch of options, I'm gonna use the pen, I'm going to use Use that purple. All right, so here, all inside here, there are all these little structures called the nephrons. There's like a, these things called nephrons. There's like a million nephrons, these little repeatable units, kind of the same way we saw in skeletal muscle, the sarcomere was the structural and functional unit of skeletal muscle, the nephron is gonna be the little structural and functional unit of the kidneys. The thing that, if we understand a nephron, we'll pretty much understand the basic of how a kidney works. So we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about the nephrons. You know, at the end, all the nephrons are gonna be making the urine and the urine is ultimately gonna be coming out the ureter. But the nephrons are the things that are in between, the things that take the blood coming in the renal artery and ultimately producing the urine coming out of the, of the ureter. Um, this renal artery coming in is just going to branch, branch and branch and branch and branch into a million little afferent arterioles that are feeding the million little nephrons. So when we look at the nephron, each nephron is gonna be fed by a tiny little branch that originated from this renal artery. Um, and again, ultimately by the end of all of the processing of the nephron, whatever's left over is gonna be the urine that leaves. Again, this is kind of showing more detail of a nephron. The nephron has the afferent arterial coming in and ultimately urine leaving. We're gonna look at this in a lot of detail. You can see from this picture, it's really twisted up. Um, in fact, the names of the different sections are called like the proximal convoluted tubule and distal convoluted tubule and loop of Henle. And, um, and we are gonna go into each of those but before we go into the convoluted and loopy kind of detail, um, we are gonna talk about the big picture of what are the processes are happening so we kind of have an idea before we get confused in the details. So let's, um, so this, I'm gonna, um, this is, I'm gonna draw this out. We're gonna look at this, but I'll draw it a little more in real time here. So the basic structural and functional unit of the kidney is the nephron. Let's make it a little smaller. So the nephron. So what we're going to do is 
talk about Nephron. First, we're going to kind of talk about overview of what is the Nephron doing in overview. Like I said, an actual nephron is all twisted up and convoluted and loopy, but we're going to look at it first on a more schematic. So it's going to be fed by this little afferent arterial. Again, this is basically the blood that is coming in. This is a tiny little branch off of that renal artery, right? I said it branches into like a million little afferent arterioles feeding each of the million nephrons. Um, this is then gonna go into a super leaky capillary called the glomerulus. Glomerulus means little ball. These are fenestrated capillaries, which we talked about being like super leaky. Um, let me. All right, so the part that's leaving here, this is called the efferent arterial, actually. This thing here, glomerulus. Wait, let me spell it correctly. I think that is. Um, Glomerulus, this is basically fenestrated capillaries. And a little ball. Um, what do we know about fenestrated capillaries? Let the things in and out. Yeah, they're super leaky. Um, the pressure coming in here is actually, it's one of the highest pressures going into, you know, capillary beds, usually the pressure's pretty low by the time you're entering into a capillary bed. When you're entering into the glomerulus, you're usually somewhere around 55 millimeters of mercury, which is pretty darn high for a capillary bed. Um, and there's a lot of leakage coming out of here, a lot of, so what's happening here in the glomerulus is gonna be what's called, this is gonna be the first part of the process of a nephron. This is called filtration. So we lose water and also small solutes. So big things like plasma proteins, and cells, they don't go out. But little things, um, anything less than like three microns is gets to leave. Things up to about, things bigger than seven to nine microns stay, get trapped, stay in the bloodstream. But small solutes, things like, you know, urea, um, you know, salts. But also, I mean, things like, um, glucose. So the thing, the thing I want to kind of make clear here is the thing that's leaving is water, which we might or might not want to keep. Solutes, some things like urea, we definitely want to get rid of. Salts, we might or might not want to get rid of, depending on what we need to for balance. Glucose, we most definitely don't want to get rid of. So the things that are getting created in filtration is a mix of good stuff you want to keep, stuff you want to get rid of, stuff you're not even sure you got to adjust. So the other thing about filtration is this is about 
of incoming blood becomes the filtrate. So let's do some math here. If 10%, what is, if I'm looking at, again, let's add across all of the nephrons in the kidneys, what is the blood flow coming in? One little 1 1.5. Yeah, so let's say it's about 1.25 liters per minute. So how much filtrate is being formed? This this is the this is the flow coming in. So this is going to be about 0.125 liters per minute filtrate is being formed. Right? So if we do the math here, if you do the math. 0.1 type two liters per minute times 60 minutes per hour times 24 hours per day. I'm gonna get my calculator. I'm gonna do 0.125, enter 60 times um, 24 times, this is 180 liters per day. All right, 180 liters, that is, you know, that's like 50 gallons or something, right? So this is obviously not your urine, right? This is not your urine. You don't pee out 50 gallons of fluid every day. Um, this is going to have to be mostly reabsorbed back into your body. You're going to have to bring back almost all, like, you know, 99% of the water. You're going to have to bring back all of the glucose. You're going to have to bring back the salts and stuff that you want to keep in your body. So this first part of the filtration is just the first part. The next part is going to be bringing back the stuff we want to keep. So we're going to collect all of this stuff. We're going to, this is called the Bowman's capsule. You basically have this tubule. We're going to call this the renal tubule. You know, this is going to have the different parts, the proximal convoluted tubule, the descending limb of the loop of Henle, the ascending limb of the loop of Henle, the proximal convoluted tubule, and going into the collecting ducts. There's going to be lots of parts to this, but for right now, we're going to stick to these overarching, um, you know, the overview, and then we'll go into the details. All right, so... If you remember the, what is the hepatic portal system? We're gonna, I'm going off, off, what was the hepatic portal system? Two capillary beds. It was two capillary beds. In that case, we had a capillary bed in the digestive organs and then a second capillary bed in the liver. This is gonna be another portal system. This glomerulus, which is, Capillary beds. The draining is like, you know, this is, there's no, the efferent arterial. Normally capillary beds don't drain into an arterial. Normally capillary beds drain into venules. So this efferent arterial is actually leading into a second capillary bed, what we call the peritubular capillaries. So
So this here, this is what we call my peritubular capillaries. as opposed to the glomerulus, which was my first capillary bed. So this was my first capillary bed here at the glomerulus. And then peritubular capillaries here. This is gonna be my second capillary bed. Whoops, try to... So capillary bed one, capillary bed two. Peritubular capillaries, this is where we are going to recover the stuff we need to reabsorb. So part one, I said, was filtration, where you are creating this filtrate. The next part is you're going to have to bring back the stuff you want to keep in your body. So this is going to, part two is going to be what we call tubular reabsorption. So basically, mo almost all of the water, the nutrients, mm. et cetera. So anything that's in the, in that filtrate that you want to keep in your body, you have to move from the tubule back into your bloodstream. So again, like I said, we're going to bring, bring in back 99% of the water. We're going to bring back all of the nutrients like the glucose. You know, things like salt it depends on your body's needs. Maybe you'll pull it back, maybe you won't. Um, part three, um, if there is still, so sometimes there is stuff you need to get rid of. Let's say for pH balance, you need to get rid of some H pluses, or maybe you have too much salt and we need to get rid of more sodium or, you know, there's stuff like that. If there's stuff that's in the body that you want to get rid of, you can actually move it actively from the bloodstream into the tubules because anything that makes it out the final bottom is going to actually be your urine. So this part three, though, this is what we call tubular secretion. Tubular secretion is if there is stuff that you want to get rid of. Like urea or could be ions mm -hmm. or whatever. Anything that's in your blood that you want to leave your body, you want to excrete you can move into the tubule where it will ultimately just become part of your urine. So here are the three main processes that are going on that we're gonna look at in more detail then. Again, filtration. The idea of filtration You've got the glomerulus, super leaky capillaries, creating this filtrate, again, 180 liters per day. So, and it includes way more stuff that, that then you want to get rid of because it's pretty indiscriminate. It lets out nutrients, glucose and stuff as well as wastes. So part two, tubular reabsorption, you're going to reabsorb the stuff you want to keep. Again, because you have this second, this peritubular capillaries where we're going to reabsorb stuff that's in the tubule that we want to keep in our body, move it back into the, into the capillary. Mm. The last part here, we can have an active moving things out of the blood into the tubule if you want to actually excrete things out of your body. So are there any questions about these three main, three main um, processes? We're going to look at each of these in turn. 
We're going to start with filtration and we're going to talk about kind of what drives filtration. This is where we're going to end up talking about the renin-angiotensin mechanism, right? Because filtration is ultimately going to depend on the blood pressure. If you don't have adequate blood pressure, you're not going to be actually having the filtrate forming. That's why the kidneys are so, um, you know, care so much about blood pressure. If you don't have adequate blood pressure, filtration stops. Um, so we're going to talk about how um, filtration um, is controlled. Then we're going to get into the details of this tubular secretion and tubular reabsorption. Um, to do that, we're going to have to get into the more convoluted nature of the tubules. We're going to get into the PCT and the DCT and the loop of Henle and um, thing place in the different properties. Parts of the tube reabsorb, parts of the tube pump, parts of the tube are impermeable to water, parts of the tube are permeable to water. So we're going to have to look at some of the um, details. You know, we're not going to get into if you want, you can get into deeper and deeper and deeper details, but we're going to get into at least kind of the first level of detail so you've got a sense of the complexity of the nephron.